faithful creator. I begin with the same prayer I offered before I prayed you started. You once again let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective words simply be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. But friends, I invite you to hear these words from the message. From first Kings. God gave Solomon wisdom, the deepest of understanding, and the largest of all hearts. There was nothing beyond him, nothing he couldn't handle. Solomon's wisdom outclassed the vaunted wisdom of wise men. It outshone the famous wisdom of Egypt, even. He was wiser than anyone, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Haman, wiser than Paul and Dara, the sons of Baal. He became famous among all the surrounding nations. He created 3,000 plus proverbs. His songs added up to 1,005. He knew about plants, from huge cedar that grows in Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows out of cracks in the walls. He understood everything about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Sent by kings from all over the earth who had heard of his reputation, people came from far and near to listen to the wisdom. So, so in my manuscript, I have a link to a podcast. I'm going to read you just an excerpt from a podcast. It struck me, I got kind of enthralled by this before my trip to New York to my daughter's graduation. It begins it's a, from Radio Lab, if you listen to that at all. I know Miranda might be someone who listens to Radio Lab. Maybe you. But I was in high school debate, so it struck me. And I know Ryan from this particular episode. So it starts, unclass your briefcase. It's time for a showdown. In competitive debate, future presidents, Supreme Court justices, and titans of industry pummel each other with logic and rhetoric. But a couple of years ago, Ryan Wash, a queer, black, first-generation college student from Kansas City, Missouri, joined the debate team at Emporia State University. When he started going up against fast-talking, well-funded, name-brand teams, it was clear he wasn't in Kansas anymore. So Ryan became the vanguard of a movement that made everything about debate debatable. In the end, he made himself a home in a strange and hostile land. Whether he was able to change what counts as a rigorous academic argument, well, that is still up for debate. This is how the Radio Lab podcast began. And I've listened to this before, but I was tagged by a longtime friend, Matt, on Facebook, wondering if I, too, had heard this podcast from March 11, 2016, which if you have it, I can send you the link. You should definitely go listen to it. Shame this plug. <laughs> it's enlightening, if only for its own merits. It talks about race and class and all the things that we kind of talk about here, even if just once a week. I have known Ryan or of Ryan for years because of his story and we've known each other, if only passing, judging students in the Casey Metro debate circuit. He's a gifted debater in his own right <laughs> that changed the landscape of policy debate. And if you don't know what policy debate is, you should go YouTube it. They are micro machine, do you know, remember the micro machine guy that talked so fast in the commercials? That's what policy debaters. Well, at least that's what they did in the time. They talked so fast 
in order to spread out their arguments so the opposing team could win by you not even being able to get to the arguments. And I'm not going to focus on his story too much because it's a it's Ryan's story. It's definitely amazing. But what I want to share is a dialogue that occurred based on the basis of my friend sharing the podcast. And here's a little bit of an excerpt from an exchange. Hugely, my friend said, how can someone even use that word anymore? Um, I wondered that too. A, I do want to listen to this, even though I wasn't a policy debater. I used to listen to Radio Lab a lot. Other friend. My issue isn't so much about policy per se. It's that much of speech and debate is still inaccessible to those in marginalized communities. The skills learned, critical thinking, empathy, research, self-esteem, public speaking, those skills are all transferable skills that help later in life. The skills that we learned help us to navigate all the careers in ways that other courses don't prepare us for adequately. All students deserve this opportunity, yet not all students are given quality instruction or opportunities. See, speech and debate was hands down the most transferable thing I did in school. It helped me pretty much make a career out of not being afraid to talk to groups of people persuasively. Also, it seemed to always attract witty oddballs, which have always been my people. A, agreed, hands down. I also think there's an idea among people who are in or who have always been in speech and debate who think that it's the only or the exclusive way to get those skills. And that's not really the case. There's also this feeling that if you add a speech and debate program to a struggling school, and give a handful of kids with resources, they are going to be suddenly better by the experience. But what usually happens is the opposite. New character comes into this discussion. It sometimes happens on Facebook, we know. Oh, for sure. And in my purple spaces, we all know what those are, right? Purple spaces, politically speaking. It has helped me to not be such a jerk. And to step back and see what might be motivating behaviors instead of just popping up on people. That has taken a certain level of maturation. And that didn't come until much later. Oh, agreed. And there have to be a multiple of other inventions and interventions for those even remotely work. So this conversation went on to direct us to a Humans of New York post. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, we see those, right? Those uplifting, mostly, sometimes not, right? They shared a beautiful story, dare I say almost prophetic story, of a young man that was changed by a debate coach. Huh. Huh. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but Brandon Stanton offers them absolutely some of the best stories. He also offers a deeper look. If you want to give just a little bit of your money on Patreon, you can do it, I think, for a dollar a month. So why do I share these stories? There's a couple of reasons. There's a disconnect with the church, right? Some folks that I run into think that not very smart people go to church, right? Some folks think that you don't even have to have a degree to be a pastor. Now, in some churches, that's true, right? You can just feel the call and you can pastor a congregation. Some people think that the church is so removed from what's actually going on in society. There's just a disconnect. They think that we're not connected. So I'm going to share another story. I met with a group of community leaders. I'm going to say that in quotes. And a candidate running for local office this week. And I use quotes around community leaders because rarely as a pastor do I feel like a community leader. Rarely is someone called to the margins, and there's no confusion there. I feel like my call is to those on the margins. But on that Zoom call, I felt really listened to by this particular candidate. 
And then yesterday, as I was volunteering at a local book uh, festival in Gaithersburg, that same candidate knew that he recognized me. He saw my face, he knew he recognized me, but in a t-shirt with all of these things showing, he just kept looking at me. <laughs> he just kept looking at me. And I said, yeah, so, hey, Mr. So-and-so, it's me. And he said, it's you? I said, yeah. So I rubber Monica Bates. He goes, you are? <laughs> so that disconnect wasn't just mine, right, y'all? <laughs> right? So in a t-shirt with my ink and my hair in a ponytail, he was confused beyond measure. <laughs> So then he said, but you said your congregation was a mainline Protestant congregation with mostly older folks? I said, it sure is. I mean, oh, not so older folks, but. And he just, I bet he stood there for three minutes because he was going to introduce the next speaker, which was the first um, author of Oprah's book club who wrote Deep End of the Ocean. And he had a rough time introducing her. <laughs> so the disconnect with the church is also a disconnect with folks outside of the church, right? We're not normal people, are we? <laughs> I was completely professional. I was managing a tent. I stayed for hours longer than I was supposed to be there. Outside, I wore my clergy collar for the Zoom that we had. And I wasn't the me he was expecting. So I reminded him. I set him at ease. He gave me a button. So I really liked him. I liked all of his policy work. I liked what he's going to do. But he was, how could I be a pastor, right? He apologized later for his confusion, right? And I've been praying for Solomon's wisdom and for Solomon's heart these past few months. <clears throat> And here's what it says. For God gave Solomon wisdom, the deepest of understanding, but he also gave him what? The largest of hearts. There was nothing beyond him, nothing he couldn't handle. You see, later in the Facebook conversation, it was said that what I, we, am, are doing is what? It's revolutionary. And I was a little mad. I was a little, I don't know if you read it, but I got, I got a little miffed. Part of me was angry. It's upsetting when people think that what caring for your neighbor, listening to opposing viewpoints, having tattoos and being a pastor is revolutionary. Putting a food pantry out there is revolutionary. How? How so? Right? Because the definition of revolutionary is involving or causing a complete or dramatic change. I'm sorry. We read the same Bible. Right? When in all actuality, what are we doing? Returning to our roots? I never left this. <laughs> This is the same Bible I've been reading since I was, I, I would say before, but let me tell you, I, you know, my, I came from a place where I struggled with reading it until my grandparents got me. It was, it was a reach folks, but my Baptist grandparents have been instilling back pantry in me that save a seat for Jesus at the table. I'm 46. There's no returning. There's no revolution. That was set for us 2,000 years ago. But who do we get angry with? Right? Should we be sad? Should we be sad that somebody says what you're doing is revolutionary? I mean, maybe. Should we be sad that someone has corrupted the good news? I love that this happens to be the one that's up here. The good news Bible, because this is the one that's in the pews back at my 
home church in Fremont. Should we be sad when our friends think of church? Rarely do they think of us. That they're thinking that someone's playing Plinko in the walls somewhere and there's cash hidden. Because that's what my friends think of. They think of corrupt congregations where, I mean, where pastors certainly aren't sharing cars with their spouses, living in a mixed income apartment complex. Who do we get mad at? Or do we just kind of go out there and say, that's not what we're doing. So instead, I'm just reminded that that's what we're here to do. There's not really anybody to be mad at. It's just that this is why we're here, right, y'all? Friends, we have Solomon's Prayer for a reason. People say, oh, well, I'm just a New Testament pastor. I'm just a New Testament. I'm a red letter Christian. Solomon's prayer has been on my heart for a while. We have Solomon's prayer. We've been given wisdom and hearts full of love. And that you, you know, come to be alive. I just want to love people. And, but I need the wisdom to do it in a way that is conscious. We have work to do. So much work to do, right? So much. But it needs to be manageable. Right? Because the world has forgotten what the really good news is. Amen.